although there has been uh, more and more talk of this kind of um, diversity subject in in this summer's API Days events, and I, I guess elsewhere too. So kind of why did you pick this topic and why did I want you to pick this topic? That is a question. <laughs> Can you just explain really briefly why this topic before you start your actual talk? Sure, absolutely. Um, it's really great timing, actually, that I'm doing this at Helsinki as well, because last year, as Monica was saying, when we did the um, the European Commission workshops in Helsinki, um, we had a really great turnout about, I think it was about 20, 30 um, uh, representatives from public service across Europe were attending. And during that, we actually had a discussion in the workshop on if we're designing a digital government API framework, how do we make sure that it's equitable for all uh, for all European citizens as well? Um, my background before API, um, my, before my API life was actually as a public health and urban planner, planning policy researcher where I focused on inequalities. And the inequalities are so in depth in all of the ways that mm -hmm. society is structured that the challenge for us in the API world, as we found at the um, workshop last year at Helsinki, mm -hmm. is that if you don't address this um, head on, you inadvertently build systems that have that inequality in it as well. Exactly. So, so I'm excited because um, it's something I've just like in the corner of uh, <laughs> in the corner oh, of reception it, rooms and everything. Yeah, yeah. but you are you are getting <laughs> back to your roots actually, and and that's so funny because I'm kind of getting back to my uh, education roots in my opening. <laughs> you know, so hey, uh, kudos for that, and let's get you started. So just share your screen, and I'm going to fade away from here. Thank okay. you, Mark, and I'm looking forward to it. Thanks. Okay. So I think you can see that that's loading. How's that? Ma uh, Mayuka, before you leave, could you just let me know that that's coming yeah. up okay? I'm still here and I will make sure. It, we are not seeing anything yet, so make sure you're pressing all the buttons. Yep. So I'm presenting at the moment. Is that working? Nope, not yet. Um, did you did you select the like click on the actual screen you wanted to share? Ah, hang on. A few minor things in the beginning of events are always expected, and yes, now we are seeing your. Um, screen and the slides are looking good. How's that? Yes, that is perfect. Good. Okay, wonderful. Thanks everyone for your patience with me on that. Um, hey, so as Mayuka said, my name's Mark Boyd. I use the pronouns he and him. So today I wanna to talk about how, how APIs can help reduce structural racism and inequality. So as I was saying to Mayuka, my former, in my former life, I was a public health and urban planner, but for the past 10 years, I've worked in the API sector, um, doing some uh, writing analysis and strategic consultancy. And as Monica uh, uh, said in her opening introduction, we've just published the API framework for digital governments as well. And here are some of my other clients. Um, uh, it's a really fantastic conference. Um, Helsinki is one of my favorites on the API Days agenda and um, there's some great speakers I'm looking forward to hearing from. A few of them I've just listed here as far as my, some of my, uh, as some of the ones that I'll be looking out for. And then I'm also uh, very grateful on the bottom row here, you can see um, there's actually a number of people I've uh, co-authored papers with here. So uh, Eric, uh, Jana Friova and I wrote a paper on uh, digital government APIs for Axway and then Monica and Lorenzino, as Monica was saying, we co-authored the uh, API framework for digital, uh, API framework for digital government. Uh, I'd also like to thank my team for Wong Pham and Arjit Mathur, who I work with at Platformable. 
So what I want to talk about today as far as APIs for addressing structural racism and inequality is that basically we all know the power of APIs. So APIs increase the speed in which you can do product development. They help you scale to a globally distributed architecture faster. And they, through a platform approach, they help them help strengthen all of your networks so you get um, flow on effects like uh, network effects where um, people in your community are mentioning your APIs to other people in the community and they're actually solving problems without you having to invest your support services or do, do marketing exercises, all of that sort of stuff. So we all know and we all pretty much agree, that's why we're here, that APIs um, increase speed, um, improve uh, scalability and strengthen networks. So that, but that also means that APIs can speed up and scale, uh, speed up scale and strengthen disparities and inequalities. I want to give two very quick examples here. So in the city government circle, there's this idea called Open 311. And Open 311 basically means that when you make a city complaint, like a pothole, graffiti, uh, vandalized um, bus, um, uh, bus, uh, uh, bus stop, um, overflowing rubbish, um, if there's been an extreme weather event and something's crashed, a tree's crashed down, you would call Open 311. Uh, in Around the world, it's called different things, um, sometimes just fix my street or just city complaints or whatever. And then APIs route that call through and they're going to make that quicker. So the call comes in and it quickly goes to asset maintenance. Asset maintenance puts it on their work roster. They go out, they repair it. And then through the open, uh, open API system, they actually then let the resident know the outcome of that, um, of that work, uh, of the complaint. So, but the issue is with APIs speeding up scaling and strengthening disparities is that high income neighborhoods have more resources. The citizens in those um, neighborhoods have more resources to call the open 311 system. So unless you've got other balances in place, what you could do over time through open 311 is actually end up redirecting a lot of your asset maintenance calls to those high income neighborhoods because they're the ones that call the most often. And there's a whole variety of reasons why low income neighborhoods can't call. They do shift work they've already been disenfranchised, they might have issues with their paperwork. Um, so for example, in Italy, um, you if you are born to migrant parents, you are only eligible to apply for citizenship between the years of 18 and 19. So if you don't apply for citizenship during that year, then it's a very difficult process. So therefore, if you live in a low income neighbourhood after that time, you're going to be less likely to phone up to report that you know, damage has happened to the bus stop or to the street because you're afraid that, um, that then you're going to be in the system and then there's going to be some follow-up retribution. You know, so there's a whole range of different things why reasons why low-income neighbourhoods might not actually call for those city complaints. But the end result is that because of APIs, suddenly all of the city's resources are being directed to high-income areas. Another example from private industry here's. Um, a uh, freelancer website where you can actually um, organize up put in to look for an API developer, for example. Now, APIs quite often in our um, websites are used for recommendation engines, but it means that those who are on the platforms for longer, who maybe had more resources, and you see this with large companies, um, uh, or even like uh, 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 landlords who own multiple properties, um, being listed in um, Airbnb and that sort of thing. So they're, they're, those that are on the platform for longer, they end up getting listed first. So there's this um, inequality spiral where those with the more resources who are on the platform at the beginning, they come up first in the search results. So they constantly get um, more work, you know, sort of thing. So for example, when I use freelance websites, I quite often look to see if I could find um, a woman who could, who I could employ through this sort of thing. And quite often you actually have to click through the first often 10, 20 pages before you can even find a woman who could, you could ask to apply for a job as much as you could ask a man. So already our systems uh, being driven by APIs are widening that inequality.
And just to be clear, our systems are biased. So, for example, in the US, they had, for COVID, they had a system where you could apply for um, what they call Paycheck Protection Program, which helps small businesses to be able to keep their employees for longer. But when they've done studies, they found that black business owners were actually turned away from banks. And you can see here, you know, this first one, sorry, I've, the um, links have dropped off. I'll make sure I've got the links on the version I upload to um, uh, the Helsinki website for after um, this this conference. But um, the in the US, banks were actually turned away um, uh, for, from applying for the um, loans when they were uh, so bank turned banks turned away um, black owners when they applied for the loans and you can see here at this second report it says it explains the reason why is because they don't have those relationships with they didn't have the relationships with the lenders banks and credit unions so we'll come back to that issue and on the right one of the issues here we can see in Europe um, Monica mentioned this briefly in her talk around COVID. And so in the top graph here, you can see that there's a large number of um, immigrants who are, are key workers in across Europe. And here the um, blue ones are those that are European citizens who are living in other areas of Europe. And the red ones are those who are immigrants from outside of Europe who come in and work in um, job, everything from cleaners and helpers, you can see is the largest there, um, personal care workers, they work in food processing, um, they you know, work in a whole range of industries that we really need those workers to be keeping going um, to work even during lockdown and that sort of thing in order for our um, economies to function. So you can see that there's a large number of immigrants in Europe who are performing those key workers, but not a single one of the European um, uh, data sets on COVID is able to tell you if um, immigrants are more at risk or getting more tested or going or are getting more prevalence of COVID. You can't be able to, you're not able to see if, um, uh, the, if that, you can't see that by key worker status, like what occupation they've got, and you can't see that by migrant status. So you can't see um, race, ethnicity. You can see they're not even really publishing gender on a lot of the CDC, uh, on the European um, uh, COVID data um, at the member state level. Here I've actually put down Finland's data. And what's really interesting on the uh, right hand side, the second graph down, Monica earlier was saying how if we had systems in place, you could actually pull all of the COVID data by API into systems. And you can see from about the middle of, that's a bit small, you can see from about the middle of um, May that in Finland, um, they did start using their API. So this green line on, this, on the second to bottom one on the right hand side shows that the country data for COVID infections comes from their API data. That's the only place in Europe I could actually find that they're pulling API data. Every other, even Estonia, um, they were doing it, they're doing it half and half from their API and then from other sources. But it was, but Finland, good on you, Finland, for doing that. But then fin, that should mean Finland should be able to break that data down into a bit more, uh, a bit more um, uh, granular data, whether that be by um, gender. Um, this age is being done, gender isn't being done. Uh, migrant um, uh, or uh, migrant background or ethnicity isn't being done. So we can't tell that there is that bias that's operating. Okay, what's this got to do with APIs? So in tech and APIs, the issue for me with APIs at the moment and API companies is that we talk about APIs enabling democratization and disrupting sectors. But if you look at our experience with that, the disruptors they're in a rush to just become the new, same as the old players. So if you look at banking, um, all of the new, most of the new neo um, uh, neo banks, a lot of the challenges have the same sort of um, business models as the previous banks. I haven't included Starling in that list because they're going all in on an API and marketplace approach and they're seeing strengths from it. They're actually the only ones out of the challenger banks in the UK that actually look like um, they're going to survive after all of this and it's because they've looked at a diversified business model using their APIs to be able to draw in small business customers. But the other ones, N26 is embroiled in um, staffing hassles at the moment. 
Um, you know, all of the others have a single business model, which is the same as or very similar to what the previous banks had. Then you can see it in a whole range of other um, services as well. Amazon, like, you know, Amazon's biggest problem, and we'll come back to this a bit later in the presentation as well, is like, so they will, on, on the face of it, they democratise retail because they allow retailers into their platform. But then they very quickly start using their data to be able to identify what's the highest selling products from those retailers that are on their platform. Then they create a generic version of that. Then they use their recommendation engines to be able to push their um, uh, their product preferences for their generic product, which is often at a lower quality than the external retailers. And then they force those external retailers to accept lower pricing models. Uh, and they, they're sort of locked into that platform. So you've sort of seen that with their retail. With the personal car and transport stuff, you see that, you know, they still haven't solved limited wheelchair access. You know, like it's you, it's not really a replacement for taxis because if you've got um, uh, uh, site issues or, um, or mobility issues, you cannot use Uber and, Lyft, uh, Uber and Lyft in a lot of places around the world. They've ended up treating their drivers poor, poorly. And then the thing that's similar with um, both uh, Uber and Lyft and Airbnb is now the, the same price as if you went to hotels or if you went to taxis. So there's, you know, I know that the taxi system had a lot of problems and, you know, it did need disrupting, but it didn't need disrupting by someone who's going to replicate the old model. And then and 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 run over um, uh, drivers in a new you know in the new way same as the old way. Anyway, so there's a few there. LinkedIn, I've just put them up here as another example because you know when LinkedIn started, they actually were scraping business data from other websites, and now they've taken companies, other startups, to court to prevent those new startups from scraping data from their website. So you know, like they're um uh, so there is you know so we talk about. One of the things I love about working in the API industry is I really do believe in the fact that APIs allow a greater level of participation from all actors involved. Um, but when you look at some of our big uh, big examples that we tend to hold up, they're, that they're not actually great actors in our communities. Uh, I'm just worried a little bit about time, so I might skip over this. Um, so. I want to talk really about five areas where API companies can address inequality. So we've got financing, recruitment, ecosystem, product design, and infrastructure. So now we really want to, so now hopefully I've set the case to show that, um, you know, like there are a number of inequalities in society. API speed up our opportunities to do stuff. So unless we actively address um, how that's happening, that, uh, how you know how our APIs are going to get used? They are going to help widen that inequality, even from um, business, not just government. So, what I want to talk about is then five, these five areas. One area that I think is of particular concern is the financing models that we've got. And so, if you look here at this graph, you can see that um, the um, during the COVID crisis, the I the um, the S and P index actually went up. So what is it that's happening when you've got, in the US, you've got a large number of black people who have been, uh, black and, and Hispanic people who have been in a, um, unequally um, seeing the impacts of COVID. You're seeing small business being reduced. There's a whole range of lockdown and yet the market is going up. So the models that we've got and the APIs, API industry trying to rush for IPOs or trying to rush for um, being part of these sorts of financing systems, we're feeding in to this to an economic model that actually doesn't value human life. You know, really is what we're saying. So there are other ways that we can do this other than just going through the IPO, uh, IPO model or trying to get um, uh, venture capital investment. That I know no one wants to hear these things, <laughs> so we can bootstrap. There are some new models around social enterprise. You know, maybe we need some new co-op models around, um, you know, a bit like seed investors, but seed investors going in and having long-term relationships with the businesses they're investing without that whole idea of we'll do a buyout, we'll go to IPO where the shareholders get here. I've also put some data up from Deal Room. You can see here um, on the right, again, 
it's only it's really only white people who are getting access to the the funding as well so and here on the bottom left i've put down gravity payments i love gravity payments um model so but they basically pay all staff including the ceo seventy thousand us annually like that's their model that's their that, that's their financing model and then as a result because of that they haven't had to look for ipo they haven't uh, you know for ipo opportunities they haven't had to Hit, um, share equity too greatly with investors, which means that they're then in a rush to try to sell out, you know. Um, so, you know, there are other models out there. I don't think there are enough that we're experimenting with in the API world on this one. Recruitment. So here you can see, um, you know, like when we talk about fintech, um, there's, you know, the number of women that um, are in management positions in fintech is really quite small. Um, so we're already, even though we're moving to open banking APIs and all of that sort of system, we're not really changing the models as far as it's still concentrating power amongst uh, men in a lot of places. And here you can see black workers in fintech, you know, like the, it was never getting above 10%, you know, at, at like Apple, um, you know, there's been no change in the last six years. And what's more is, is businesses like, look, if you look from 2019 and 2020, um, uh, Apple and Facebook have even stopped reporting. Apple, Facebook and Microsoft have all st st stopped reporting on their um the numbers of black workers that are employed in 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 um in their organizations but it's not just the um the issue of um the inclusion reporting that i think is the issue and i'm like i i i think the people who work in um uh, diversity equity and inclusion training are awesome and they're very passionate about their work i don't think we're seeing any big changes or sufficient changes in um, the recruitment and in the employment um, and management opportunities for women and for um, people of colour, um, because that's not enough in itself and we need more. And here's a good example. I've just got Tracy Edwards here on the left-hand side. One of the, she's just in grad school and she's already seen what happens is that they'll have projects to look at diversity in the classroom and blah, blah, blah. She has been asked to do those. You know, and I've heard of people who are, um, people of colour who, who apply for jobs as engineers and they're told, oh, there's a job actually, we need a diversity and inclusion uh, training uh, person in our engineering team. So they, so instead of being recognised for as being engineers in their own right, they've been pushed just into these um, diversity roles, you know, sort of thing. So, um, so, so there's this sort of issue. But then there's also other issues when there are women and... Uh, people of colour in the workplace where they're not being supported fully. Like, so the number of women I know who have spoken at conferences, and luckily I think um, the API sector is a bit better, but we'll see once there's the, um, uh, the videos going out. The number of women who present at conferences who then have to deal with um, people contacting them afterwards saying, you're really pretty, you were great in this. Like, that will be one level of talk and then another level of talk will be um uh why didn't you mention this or what's your proof or what's your source about that so there's either two angles they're either um everything they've spoken about has just been ignored and they're just uh, you know and then they've been objectified or they are finding much more attacks from people who are then questioning every all of their findings when they could actually just do a Google search and find out for, for themselves. So, you know, like there is an issue here around how we support and um, encourage uh, women and people of colour in our workforce as well. I'm just mindful of the time, so I have to go through pretty quick. The ecosystem, this is the one of the main ones I really wanted to talk about though. So, um, but one of... The, as API providers, I think one of the things that we are able to do is actually look who is part of our ecosystem. You know, and like, so one of the big issues I find that we're not really doing is we're not looking to see if the, the consumers of our APIs are representative of all groups. So here on the left side, you can see from FSG um, that what they suggest, they suggested this for um, a practical approach for COVID. But what you would actually do as an API provider, as a product manager, for example, is actually look at all of your API consumers. 
how many of those API consumers are coming from women-owned businesses, are coming from migrant-owned businesses? You know, can you do more outreach to um, those communities to encourage them so that they're not uh, so that they're able to use your APIs as much as large companies and male-owned companies? And can you even look at the end users? So if you're working in alternative lending APIs, for example, how do you know that your APIs aren't just driving all lending back towards white-owned businesses or to uh, white high-income um, members of your community, you know, so like, so again, we should be trying to uh, look at that level of how our ecosystem is being diverse. And that's something I think that API uh, providers can start with, you know, we'll come back to a few more suggestions at the end. Another one is to have a look at whether your developer portal is actually um, accessible to all developers. Like, so there, so there is the A11Y project, um, and here's the link here where you can actually do accessibility scores of your developer portal, of your documentation to make sure that it's um, available and accessible to all to all developers. Here's some examples of some um, ecosystem approaches that I think are really uh, that that are looking at trying to diversify their. Um, ecosystem. I think they can, uh, it is a little bit pushed off onto the social impact side of things, which is great. You know, like these companies are doing really well, Twilio, um, Algolia and Tyke, for example, here. But they can also, in addition to this, they could also then look at who, you know, Twilio, this is their um, uh, social impact fund so for nonprofits. So that's great. But they could also, Twilio could also look at all of their ecosystem users and see whether or not they are so they are sort of representative of um, the broader community as well. Um, product design, you know, like here, I think there's a great quote, you know, about like you know the sort of design of products that we're getting from APIs. They're going back towards um, they don't really proactively design for um, women for people of color. So there, you know, like we can sort of start to ask whether or not our products are suiting everyone. And I love the um, Gemify tech, which is on the right here. I'll put up the link for the um, uploaded version. But they've got a product called Emerald, which is helping people be able to identify via APIs whether or not the business is ethically uh, responsible. And so that people can make better decisions around who they're going to support because of this and that's all built on APIs and crowdfunding. Infrastructure, I could go on with. Um, I won't get into too greatly other than what I was saying about um, Amazon with retail. That's going to come to Amazon Web Services as well. So if you're building products on Amazon Web Services, then you're helping concentrate power. And we need to be looking at how to diversify that. And I really encourage this reading on the right here but from Steve Sammartino, who was actually an API Day speaker in Australia several years back, and he talks about digital sovereignty. It's really challenging because I am anti-borders and anti-nationalism, but the problem is that when we don't have digital sovereignty, like, and I, and I know, you know, France's Gaia project isn't a great example of this, but when we don't, we're concentrating all power into those five um, tech giants that, um, that haven't shown that they're really responsible as far as balancing um, who gets to play sort of thing. And you can see in Australia in the news today, for example, Facebook's now threatening to um, uh, ban Australians from sharing news because there's new regulation, which is trying to make sure that um, news providers get some revenue benefit back from uh, Facebook and Google when they um, use their media sources, you know, sort of thing. So we already see this sort of um, strong arm tactics that's been used and we're familiar with that from a number of other um, API companies as well. So really when we're talking about uh, the- Mark, I'm pushing you a little bit of time. So a couple of minutes. Yeah. No yeah. <laughs> two, I've got two minutes from my clock, so I'll, yeah. I'll make sure I finish within those. And I'm really happy to have a discussion about this with anyone afterwards as well. But really, you know, like the thing is you're already making trade-offs. So the decisions you make now around using Amazon Web Services, they're going to affect you um, in the future. You're already making decisions around Amazon Web Services in that um, you're choosing them because of a pricing thing 
even though you're needing to invest more developer time because their documentation is so bad. So you're already paying off, you know, you're already sort of um, trading off some of that stuff. Um, anyway, it's all about trade-offs. Um, I'd love to have more of a talk to you about that. The um, I just want to quickly end with five quick things you can do. One, decentralize. Can you stop using Facebook? Facebook is a propaganda of, of hatred, you know, basically. Like there's no, I know we all see marketing benefits of it. For an API provider company, I don't think we need to use Facebook to be able to market to developers. So maybe, you know, I would strongly urge you to get off that. Consider your use of AWS services. I use Airtable, which is built on AWS. I wanted to start using Notion, but Notion's built off AWS as well. So I want to pull back from having all of the tools that I use all being built off AWS. Can you use another Google, another search engine besides Google? You know, for 80% of your searches, maybe DuckDuckGo will be great, you know. And then if there's a very specific niche one that you need to do, maybe you do need to go to Google to get that um, extra support, you know. But find out about digital sovereignty and have a look into, you know, what we can do around that. Now, this is the big take home, really. It's like analyse your ecosystem and user base. Like, so look at, you know, how many API consumers work in women-owned and migrant-owned businesses. Is there a way you can reach out to those businesses more. And then like I was saying earlier, do you know the end users? How are they accessing services? And are your products reaching a diverse set of community? If you're in the European Union, then you need to sort of help us start asking why isn't there collected data on small businesses that are women or migrant owned? Um, okay, I really haven't got any more time, I'm out of time. So, uh, so my apologies, I think I got loaded down in the explanations at the beginning a bit too much first. So there are some other techniques that I'd be happy to talk to you about. Um, I've mentioned some of these uh, briefly. The um, This one, you know, like look at your feature, your next API feature and sort of say, you know, what are the impacts and the consequences of this, uh, uh, of this feature? You know, will it widen inequalities? Even just these conversations once or twice will be a huge step forward from what we're doing today. Okay, so here's my contact details in the uh, bottom right corner of this. My apologies for um, getting the balance wrong around uh, what are, uh, around the um, timing of all of this, but uh, I'd love to keep chatting with you about this if you like. Thanks. Thank you, Mark, and, and no worries. I kept a little bit. Uh, you with the first questions, I think. So uh, I'm not seeing yet any questions in the chat for you, but if there are any, I'm sure that you will be able to answer a few questions during the next talk. And, and um, hey, it was great.